everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. My name is Bridget. I'm the Regional Director from Enterprise Singapore South Africa office. Today, we've got a very exciting webinar for you lined up. Um, it's on the healthcare or health technology opportunities in Africa. This is part of the Africa Singapore Business Forum digital webinar series that we have. Um, so before we get going, um, by now all of you would be familiar with some of the housekeeping rules, but we just need to kind of go through it just very quickly. Um, there are two functions that you need to familiarize yourself with. Um, there is the Q&A function. That is where you should direct all of your questions to. Um, and if you could as well um, to indicate which uh, panelists your question is directed to. If you have any technical matters or question that you would like to direct to the Enterprise Singapore team instead, uh, please use the chat function or if you've got any comments um, that you just kind of want to respond to feel free to also use um, the chat function to interact with some of the other participants or the panelists um, and anything else yeah again just use the chat function for the program um, we are going to start off first with a very short opening address um, followed by the panel discussion as well as the q a so to kick things off we have uh, miss cassandra go who is our deputy director um, to just give a few opening remarks. Over to you, Cassandra. Sure, thanks. Thanks everyone. Um, just for, okay, I'm starting my video now. Can you hear me well? Okay, thanks again, Bridget, and good afternoon, morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Cassandra, Deputy Director for Middle East, Africa, and South Central Eastern Europe in Enterprise Singapore, ESG. So welcome to the webinar on the healthcare technology opportunities in Africa. This is the second webinar we are conducting under the umbrella of Africa Singapore Business Forum, ASBF for short. And ESBF is one of ESG flagship events that we organize every two years. And this premier platform is to facilitate business exchanges and foster trade between Africa and Asia by bringing together business communities from this region to interact and network. In the past five edition, there have been over 2,000 business leaders and government officials from more than 30 African and Asian countries who have attended this event in Singapore. Unfortunately, due to COVID this year, we had to postpone ASBF to August next year. And what we have put in place then is an eight-part webinar series to continue sharing the exciting opportunities in Africa. The first webinar a few weeks back surfaced new prospects in the education space. And over the next nine months, we'll bring in more topics focused on technology opportunities in Africa, brought about and exacerbated by COVID. Topics such as agri-tech, retail tech, trade and logistic tech will be highly featured. And in addition, we will also showcase general market opportunities focusing on developments in the east, southern, western parts of Africa. Despite the African economies being hit hard by the pandemic, with growth expected to shrink by about 2 to 5% in 2020, there are still, still some silver lining to be uncovered in the horizon. Our esteemed speakers today will share how the healthcare scene in Africa is rapidly evolving and how new services such as telemedicine is gaining traction. There are also increasing need for virtual healthcare skills training for medical staff, up-to-date medical equipment, and better track and trace solution. I am sure you will gain much insights today. We look forward to you joining us for our eight-part webinar series and do look out for electronic invitation and details on the registration process in the coming months. We also welcome you to join us at ASBF 2021 in August next year. So on this note, I wish everyone an enjoyable and beneficial session. I'll hand the time back to my colleague Bridget. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Cassandra. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator for the session. Um, this is Ernest. Um, he's a well, very able moderator. He's got lots and years of experience working across the continent. He's based out of South Africa, but has really been working the ground, working with 
African governments, international organizations, as well as many, you know, big corporates and smaller corporates out in, you know, different spheres of the healthcare system. So I'll leave Ernest to kind of take over from here and also introduce our esteemed panelists. Thank you, Ernest. Great. Thank you so much, Cassandra and Bridget. It's a great honor uh, to facilitate and moderate this panel. I come to you from Cape Town, South Africa this morning. Greetings to everybody. I trust everyone is safe and well, wherever you are. Um, I, my company, Broadreach, uh, we are very much focused on how to use new fourth industrial revolution technologies to improve population and individual health outcomes. And interestingly, as devastating and terrible as COVID has been for the world and the African continent, um, it has also presented the why it's an imperative that we very rapidly um, transform ourselves to using more technology. And it's made the, it's almost made the case um, now a non-negotiable that you actually have to do it. Whereas before COVID, it was a nice to have. Um, COVID, COVID made it an absolute priority that countries rapidly accelerate their digital transformation because as, for example, there's a reason why we're doing this call on Zoom and not in person. Same now has affected health services with the ability, for example, for people to go and see their providers uh, the way they traditionally did. And now, for example, there's a lot more, um, you know, telephone, video consults, telemedicine, et cetera, because it's kind of the only way you can still deliver the services. So with that, as, as, as a preamble, I really do think as bad as COVID has been, I think it, from a technology point of view, it's presenting more opportunities potentially, but it is a marketplace that is interesting, vibrant, but has some big challenges. And our panelists uh, today will be taking us through some of those. So I'd like to uh, do a quick round of introductions of our panelists. I'd ask our panelists just to turn on their videos for now uh, alone. And then as uh, I'll ask each of them to quickly do a two minute or so introduction of their companies. And then I'll do a round of thought discussion starter questions uh, for the panelists, um, and then eventually we'll open up uh, to, the, to the main plenary of the entire meeting. So let's go around and start with Jay. Um, Jay, would you mind telling us about two minutes about your company? And yes, Jay good is morning. North Nigeria. Good morning, good morning, everybody. And, um, so my name is Jay, I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Tremendoc. Tremendoc is a, a telemedicine solution here in Nigeria. It's, it's been around for about three years. Um, a couple of the past couple of months, we've we've seen an amazing growth, um, especially due to COVID. We've been able to successfully have done over sixty five thousand consultations. Um, our users are able to talk to doctors um, remotely using our mobile app and then via chat, audio, or video call. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Jay. Um, could we then have Henri? Uh, could you please introduce yourself? Um, morning, afternoon, everyone, wherever you find yourselves in the world. Um, and it's nice to see another South African on the line. So, um, how's it? Guys, uh, yeah, thank you uh, for, for the invite. Um, you know, Bridget and I met a while ago, and um, our career is uh, quite an interesting one. We quite a company that's an old business. So, we got um, two major shareholders that got involved um, with us around about in 2018, mid middle of the year. Uh, we have since bought um, eight different businesses. We started through organic um, startups, technology, and, and, and I'll take you through that in a moment. And essentially what we do on the buy and build track. So we buy specialized distribution businesses. We started in the cardiology space and moved on to general surgery. We then business in um, called UTEC and in anything from blood, you know, from apheresis to collections, etc. Uh, we then uh, went into a business called LTE that is a mobile healthcare. Um, they all over Africa. We cover about 14 countries in Africa in partnership with um, a whole bunch of people, and as that you from right to care to FPD exam. 
Um, and there we provide high tech um, solutions as well as, um, you know, screening people. You know, we screen uh, 5 million people on HIV, uh, two and a half million people on TV and on, and that gets up into the cloud and we analyze the data. And then, um, the thing, and then we bought a business in orthopedics, uh, extremities, and we bought a business in uh, consumables. And we just concluded a transaction with uh, buying a bunch of technology businesses. So it's been a, it's been a great growth for us. Um, and um, I think maybe on the detailed questions, we'll get, um, you know, we'll get um, into some more detailed questions that the moderator, that you might have for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Henry. Um, and next, if we could have uh, Mr. Suleiman Shahabuddin, uh, the East Africa Regional CEO for the Aga Khan Health Services. Thank you. Thank you, Ernest. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, very happy, delighted to participate in today's session. Uh, indeed, Africa is an exciting business destination. And I'm uh, very happy, delighted to see the interest of the Singaporean uh, business sector. Uh, I work for the Aga Khan Development Network. Uh, which is uh, commonly commonly known as the AKDN. Uh, the AKDN was founded and, and, and continues to be guided by, by His Highness the Aga Khan. Uh, the system brings together a number of development agencies, institutions, and programs that work primarily in underserved parts of Africa and Asia. A central feature of, the, of our approach to development is to design and implement strategies in which different agencies participate in particular settings to help those in, those in need achieve a level of self-reliance and improve the quality of life. Uh, the agency that uh, I run in East Africa uh, is known as the Arkan Health Services. It is one of the three agencies of the AKDN that supports activities in health, the others being the Arkan University and the Arkan Foundation. Uh, together, these agencies provide healthcare to almost 6 million people annually and work closely on planning, training, and resource mobilization. Uh, the key areas of focus include population health, service delivery, health sciences, health sciences education, and cross-cutting themes such as healthcare financing, quality development, and so on. In East Africa, we have a rich history of over 90 years. Uh, our first facility was established in 1929 in Dar es Salaam. Uh, today, we operate an integrated health network comprising of five hospitals and uh, 92 other outreach and specialized healthcare uh, facilities across uh, Tanzania and uh, Uganda. Two of our hospitals, the one in Nabi and Dar es Salaam, Joint Commission Accredited, which is, uh, which, is, which, is, which is a high level of standard for quality and patient safety, and both of these are uh, teaching hospitals as well. So I'll just stop there and, you know, and I'll be happy to, to speak more about it uh, when the questions come. Thank you. Thank you, Anas. Thanks so much, Suleiman. Looking forward to really hearing uh, about your wealth of experience you've had in the East Africa region. Uh, next, if I may ask um, Ms. Loretta Kathleen Foran, who leads the Tech Emerge program at the IFC to introduce herself. Great, thank you. Thank you, Ernest. And thank you all for having me join you today. Happy to be here. Uh, so as Ernest mentioned, I work at the IFC. My name is Loretta Horn. I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, IFC is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group. We have the same overarching development mandate as the World Bank to end extreme poverty and promote shared prosperity, but we do this through a private sector lens. We work across multiple sectors in terms of health, education, infrastructure, agribusiness, financial services, et cetera. We're present in over 100 uh, countries and have over 2,000 active clients that we're working with. We have a global portfolio of about uh, $60 billion with an active portfolio of 2 billion in healthcare companies across emerging markets. I personally sit in a group called Disruptive Technologies and Funds, and we look to see how we can leverage new technologies to accelerate the development agenda. And so we had developed a program called Tech Emerge Health, which I'll talk a bit about later, that looks to accelerate uh, new health technologies in emerging markets. We started the program back in 2016 in India, and then we implemented it in Brazil in 2017-18. And then we launched an Africa program earlier this year with the first focus on East Africa, which we're in the middle of right now. But I'll pause there and I can provide more details later. Thank you so much. 
So I'd like to kick off the discussion at this particular point and start with a few questions for each of the panelists. Uh, starting with Jay, um, in your opinion, uh, what are the main challenges in Nigeria to launching an innovative uh, digital technology business like Tremendoc? Uh, thank you. Um, I think in the, the past three years working, I think the biggest challenge is education, um, educating people around um, telemedicine. Um, because there's this cultural thing and what people used to uh, go in, into a physical um, um, hospital and then having doctors, you know, examine them, you know, check their vitals before they give a diagnosis. And, uh, you know, in the birth of telemedicine and where we started, we faced the challenge of trying to explain to people how this could work um, without necessarily a doctor being, you know, physically present. Um, and one of the ways that we tried to achieve this was partnering with um, bigger corporations. Um, and so what our strategy was, was as far as you, you trust these corporations like financial institutions and most the state government and the federal government, um, they're able to, you know, trust, they trust the institutions and then in, in you know, that also transcends into them trusting our brand as tremendous and uh, what the possibilities were. So Jay, just to clarify, so that means you sort of ran the education initiatives through these corporates and institutions? Yes. Okay. Yes, yeah, so with the partnerships that we did with these corporate institutions, they are able to um, talk directly to their customers or their consumers. So whether it was financial institutions, um, we were able to partner with them and they, they get um, access to the service for free. And then they, the banks are able to explain in their language how to use the service, you know, and, and we're still gradually trying to educate people on, on what telemedicine is in general. And have you uh, run into issues of, you know, bandwidth, connectivity, you know, people use diff, you know, technological difficulties with people using your platform or is that uh, is internet penetration quite good in Nigeria and that's not really a, a big factor. Okay, so for, from the beginning, we, we already thought about that um, before we, we decided to launch uh, the mobile app. And that's why you have three access points. You have, you can chat with a doctor, uh, you can use an audio call and use a video call. This, these three services or channels um, require different bandwidths, right? So with your chat, you, you know, with your small internet connection, you can actually um, still go through and, and have a chat with a doctor. Um, and this goes through with um, all the channels. But we also thinking about the rural area because we're working with a lot of state governments now. And we also introduced another service where you don't necessarily need internet. All you need to do is call, use your mobile network to call in and then you'll get connected to a doctor. So we have these two services um, to one that requires internet and while the other doesn't. So if I may move to Henri next, um, how receptive are healthcare institutions, public and private in adopting new technology? Um, and what are some of the challenges you face when approaching them uh, to adopt some of the newer offerings? I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of a double, um, you know, the, the way South Africa runs, um, you know, we have uh, just some demographics for the group who's not too familiar with uh, our country is that let's say roughly rounded numbers, there's about 60 million population of only 8 million people on private care. So 52 million aren't. Um, so access to healthcare is tricky. And um, so for, I'll come back to the public side now. So on the private side, um, what the funds have is they have these, uh, we call them HTAs, they health technology assessments. And uh, one of the main funds in South Africa kind of drives that and the others typically adopts it because they, they cover out of that 8 million, um, you know, around about 40% of the market insures for them. And um, so what we have seen is South Africa is quite ripe and, and increasingly so for new technology. There's certainly a need for it. It's, uh, it's, it's always been a country that are 
driven by many innovative uh, minds and people. But it is, it is certainly hindered by the fact that um, on a, an affordability basis. So the funds aren't always that keen to, to look at new technologies, unless you could prove that there's clinical um, evidence that it works, you know, and that has a legal slant to it in terms of suits. Um, and on the public side, you almost got to treat people um, on an individual basis, and it's got to have an affordability angle to it, because now it's not insured. So, um, but just quickly to bounce back, I, I just have to qualify that. If, you know, earlier I explained to you, you know, we have 15 different divisions in Betis now. So mm -hmm. if you look at the cardiology division that consists out of, you know, all these subdivisions, you know, they are treated differently, for example, what our orthopedic businesses would be. Mm -hmm. And the reasons would be not because there are double standards. It's just the way that cardiology is treated in South Africa and, and the way that it's looked at at the critical care versus on orthopedics, you know, it's, uh, it's different. The guys are keen on navigation systems. They're keen on 3D printing. They're keen on all sorts of goodies. And Vitiz is doing a lot in that. But in the cardiology space, you know, it's more critical of nature. So there, it, it, it often takes on a more conservative stance. Um, and uh, the funds are more careful introducing new tech. You know, if you want to have an app that monitors your pacemaker and adjusts it for you, when you don't feel good, it's doable. I mean, we've tested it, but it doesn't mean that people want it, you know, because what, what if it goes wrong? You know, and I can give you a ton of it. And um, how would you say um, you've overcome these challenges? Um, just maybe some, a few practical examples of challenges you ran into in trying to convince people to move to some of these newer platforms. Um, and what did, what did it take, basically? Again, um, just to, you know, for the different divisions, it's been different. So um, what we have seen a huge uptake during these uh, crazy six months that the world has found them in. Um, online education have become huge for us. We have a very strong platform um, in VTs that we use. Um, we have a very strong program, you know, in terms of we have a, I don't know if it's a global thing, but in South Africa, you have what they call the CPDs for the doctors, the continuous development that they have. So we have a platform that uh, facilitates the certification and the allocation of points on the back of what we do. Um, and then we have the little bit more simplistic ones um, that uh, Joomla that I've mentioned, that is our medical supply business. Um, they don't like it if I call them a consumable business, but there's a lot of consumables in what they do. So PPEs and all that jazz. Um, yeah. That we have had a, a very good um, you know, run on during these times. So. So the way that we bring it into the market, just to get more specific to your question, is um, first and foremost, we work with um, um, the funds. Funds have appointed, which is very good for South Africa, they've appointed data analysts. So they have gone and they, because you've got to consider, if I just give you the, the demographics of our land, you know, there aren't too many if, if you want to only approve things on the base of case studies of people that have actually gone through a certain procedure, you're always going to lack numbers. Mm -hmm. So what the funds have opened up to now is that you can look at global stats. Because mm -hmm. if you look at our business, you know, Abbott is a provider, Stryker, Terumo, you know, we are Hazi. We have uh, a very many international, well-renowned brands and their products are useful over the globe. So what the South African market is opening up to is to use global data, apply to South African context, and then use those insights into getting stuff through the system. And that's starting to take. Great. Um, I'm, I'm sure the audience will have uh, quite a lot of questions for you, Andrew. Um, next, I'd like to move to uh, Suleiman. Um, you, your work covers you know, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, you know, the East African footprint. What is the healthcare landscape like across East Africa and what are the main challenges? Uh, thank you, thank you, Ernest. Uh, I think there are important facts that we should keep in mind. First and foremost is that within these three countries, or sorry, between these three countries, we are looking at a combined population of almost 160 million people. That is a significant population number. 
Second uh, is the fact that the population is fairly young. The median age is around 20 years. Uh, third, and I think an important fact is that these countries have been making ec economic progress. Uh, Kenya, Kenya in 2014 and Tanzania only this year achieved middle income country status. In terms of healthcare, the spending on health for these countries is currently around 6% of the GDP, which uh, granted is, is, uh, is, is, is low when you compare this against the Abuja Declaration, uh, where these countries have all agreed to spend 15% of the GDP on health. Um, Tanzania and Uganda currently do not meet the WHO standards of $44 per capita spending to provide essential health services. However, there is good news. And the good news is that with the improvement in economies, these countries have been steadily increasing their expenditures on health. Take, take, for, take for example, Uganda, which enhanced its spending on health, its, its per capita, capita spending on health from $22 in 2003 to $38 in 2017, uh, uh, growing at an average annual rate of slightly over, over 5%. Tanzania likewise increased its per capita sp spending on health from $20 to $34. Kenya did really well, increasing its spending from $25 in 2003 to $77 in 2017, uh, growing at a rate of 9%. Uh, in all these countries, uh, the government still remains the largest provider of healthcare services uh, in Kenya, for example, which is an economic power within the within the East African context. Uh, more than half of the healthcare facilities are owned by the government. Uh, the private sector is vibrant; is becoming more vibrant. And when we include the faith-based health facilities, makes up the other half. Uh, in Tanzania and Uganda, almost two-third to three-fourth of the facilities currently belong to the government but you can see that the private sector is becoming more and more um, active. So, uh, so also, also the fact is that these countries are very focused on universal health coverage. And as these countries progress on the USC agenda, the demand for healthcare is set, to, is set to increase. And this therefore presents an opportunity to not only companies from Singapore, but elsewhere to be part of this uh, growth uh, journey. Uh, Ernest, you asked about challenges. It's really the same that we see um, across the world. The challenges are of access, creating more access, reducing cost, and uh, improving quality. And uh, and to me, and and you know, this um, this webinar of today is, is talking about digital health. And to me, digital health presents a real opportunity to improve access, uh, reduce cost, and to improve quality. Uh, so I'm sure that this initiative will be will be quite quite welcome. Um, clearly the manufacturing base for healthcare supplies is low, whether we talk of PPEs or, or uh, other uh, testing equipment and so on. So that's another opportunity as well. Uh, I mean, and, and, and again, you know, in terms of challenges, it's really the same healthcare financing, assuring quality, uh, human resources, and all of these will require significant investments uh, to, to kind of, you know, make sure that the population and the citizens of this country uh, have access to good health. But I mean, in Canada, I must say that there has been real progress and there has been good progress. So I'll just, I'll just stop the rest. And you mentioned, in essence, sort of the, the, the issue of access um, and, um, and I guess implied within that is there's a mismatch of supply and demand, right? Um, you don't have enough services for the demands on them. Do you mind just maybe touching very briefly on the availability of specialties, uh, specialty services. For example, across East Africa, each of the countries, if I needed a cardiologist, you know, um, would I be able to get one? If I needed a radiologist, would I be able to get one? A uh, kidney specialist, for example. Uh, right. are, are those specialties there or do we still find, in my experience, you know, you have to either travel to India to get certain services or uh, travel to South Africa to get those services? How is it at the moment? So again, um, uh, Ernest, we have to look at it country-wise. If you look at Kenya, Kenya probably has the most advanced healthcare infrastructure and facilities uh, and, and specialities when it comes to mm -hmm. healthcare. So that does not mean that people don't travel from Kenya to India or South Africa, 
but you will find that Kenya is um, has been well endowed with healthcare professionals and uh, and tertiary tertiary level uh, healthcare. Tanzania is just opening up. Uh, so in Tanzania, the growth of tertiary services, specialized services like the one you mentioned, oncology, cardiology, neurosciences, uh, are all provided uh, by the government. Uh, I mean, our hospital has just started providing tertiary services from 2014 in Daraskam. We did a major expansion of $83 million to establish a world-class teaching tertiary hospital. Uh, but Tanzania, we still struggle. So we have to rely on expatriate doctors to come in and so on. Uganda is the same. It's just opening up to the private sector. Uh, and again, while there, are, while there are some private facilities, but when it comes to specialized care, uh, people, people still travel. So I would say Kenya is number one in that landscape. Tanzania is trying to catch up, cope up. Um, and Uganda is still some ways, some ways away. Uh, but to me, Ernest, that is also the opportunity. That's also yeah. the opportunity. Uh, you know, when the market is being developed, uh, you know, you need, you want to be part of that, of that journey uh, at that point in time. Um, in the countries, uh, Suleiman, that where in particular you mentioned Tanzania and Uganda that are a little bit behind Kenya, is there a solid acknowledgement that technology is our answer or are they still of the mindset that we're going to train enough doctors one day, we're going to, you know, in essence, you know, do this without technology uh, or are they seeing the only way basically we can, um, in essence, um, uh, leapfrog this is through technology. Do you, are you seeing that acknowledgement or not? And yes, yes, I'm honest. So to, to give you an example, Tanzania wrote its first uh, e-health strategy at the Ministry of Health level, recognizing okay. uh, the importance of technology. Um, okay. So clearly, clearly there, are, there are ways to go. There's a long way to go. Uh, especially when you talk of rural populations, when you talk of things like uh, picture archiving and communication systems or imaging transfers and so on to come into the country or, or electronic health records to come in um, or really virtual care to be strengthened. But, but I can tell you and I can tell everyone on this uh, session today that all the discussion that at least I have participated in at the government level, uh, there, is, there, is a, uh, there is serious consideration and uh, and serious attention to moving to moving moving forward in that uh, direction. Thank you so much. I've been asked I've asked that question very particularly because, um, for example, my company we we launched our digital health product, um, which is a population health uh, and decision support AI and machine learning based platform in 2014. And you know, sort of you know, whereas there's been a long our dialogue about yes, yes, we need technology. What we've found is people aren't actually procuring it, and I just in our humble experience. So this is a, a theme I'd like to explore with the panel a lot more. So which brings me to Loretta. Um, Loretta, um, across the African continent, there's a lot of acknowledgement that we need to use new and innovative technologies to address these grand challenges that we all acknowledge. Um, and the rhetoric is there, but the adoption seems to be really slow. How come, in your experience, why is this the case? So I think we see this across the globe, just the World Bank Group is, does have a global presence and it's not something that's unique to Africa where we see across emerging markets, there is a slow uptake on new innovations and including in the healthcare uh, space. I think some sectors are a little bit faster to move. I know particularly in East Africa, FinTech has taken off quite a lot. But so this is one of the questions that we actually posed about five years ago, because within my team, uh, our group has a venture capital team, which looks at about a thousand tech companies a year across multiple verticals, health tech, edutech, e-commerce, e-logistics. And while a lot of them are too early stage for IFC direct investment, we, we see that they can have huge impact in emerging markets, but they're slow on the uptake. It's like, why, why are they not penetrating in, the, in these markets? And so there were three main market gaps that we saw. One is awareness gap. And so in some cases, let's take the African health context where the healthcare providers in Africa might not be aware of the latest cutting edge innovations happening around the world. One that we've seen is it depends on the health system where there can be a spectrum where some probably like Agacon who are uh, bigger players in the market may get a lot of tech companies knocking on their door every day. 
and they can't vet and validate who's good, who's serious, what's the difference between one product and another. And then the reverse is that a lot of health systems have no one knocking on their door. They don't know what's going on in the market. They don't know what's the new innovations. Separately, innovators often, particularly if they're in developed countries or if they're sitting in the US or UK or in Singapore, they don't know about the needs and opportunities in emerging markets. They don't know if their solution is valid for that specific market. The second gap, so awareness is one, second is know-how. So even if a health system has heard of something notionally and we meet a lot of CEOs who say, oh, I read an article about X or Y, they don't know will it work in their own individual health system? Is it something that would add value for them? And separately on the innovator side, it's often difficult, particularly if you're sitting in another country to access the new market. Who, who are the prospective clients? Is, this, is the, uh, your solution needed? They're unaware of business protocols, regulatory landscape. And so it's hard for the health tech system, the healthcare provider to assess the different solutions and hard for the innovator to, to then access the market. And then lastly is the affordability point that uh, Henry made in the, the financing side of things. It's, uh, it can be expensive. There's, cap, there's both financial and human resources required to enter new markets. And it's risky because you don't know if there will be that uptake. And for them, on the healthcare provider side, they don't know, I'm not willing to necessarily engage and procure right away if I don't have that um, clinical validation that, again, Henry was talking about. And so that's actually why we looked to develop this program, this Tech Emerge Health program, which we see as a risk, risk mitigation tool. It helps people to be able to learn about new technologies, see if it operate that you work in their own operations and we provide grant funding to, for people to test and try. So I'll just quickly talk about the, the process and then um, and we'll get into too much detail, but happy to provide more later. What we do is we enter each market and we see what are the core, who are the large, we as IFC typically work with the private sector. So we uh, will mobilize private healthcare providers in a select sector, meet with them individually to learn about their core needs, challenges, pain points, how they view technology today. Then we aggregate demand across these health systems and we launch an open call for applications. So in the East Africa context, that open call was held in January, February, earlier this year. We had 450 health tech companies from 50 countries apply to the program. Then it's a competitive selection process where we then select the top technologies that we think could be market appropriate. And then we introduce them to the healthcare systems. And it's a very demand driven approach where we go back to individual health systems to say, based on your needs, things you express interest in, we think these companies might be of interest. Typically we have an in-person matchmaking meeting due to the COVID situation, we went virtual this year. We held our matchmaking event three weeks ago in East Africa. And then after the event, so health system and tech companies get a chance to engage. And then we say, if people are in working together, develop a pilot proposal for IFC consideration. And we have a million dollars in grant funding to support pilots. And so then they test and try before they move to contracts to purchase decisions. But, so this is one intervention that we had to try to bring awareness on how health technologies can support health systems and their operations. And then they get a chance to actually just invalidate the solutions and see that there is that clinical evidence for and the value for money before they move to a contract. Loretta, I, I find that a really, really interesting approach in this market because, for example, one of the things we encountered, and I'm sure many of the others on the call may have encountered, is what I call like the innovator's curse, right? So uh, people say, we're innovative. We want, we want to be at the cutting edge of innovation. And then when you give them an innovation, they ask you, where's the 2,000 places you've done it, right? And by definition, it's not innovation if it's already been done 2,000 times, right? So you end up stuck in this, in this loop. So I think what you described seems to address, you know, it bridges people across that, um, that gap that normally is, is insurmountable where they say, I need more proof points before I can acquire your innovation. You're helping to do that in a de-risked way uh, with, with your program at the IFC. So I think it's an amazing program. And I think a lot of the companies on this call could probably really benefit from working with you in terms of looking at entry into the African, into the African continent. So, so thank you for those, that initial round of comments. I want to now do a, one, one quick round with everybody. Just um, asking about COVID-19, right? I mean, this has been, you know, the, the, uh, the, one of the most unique experiences of our lifetime from a public health perspective uh, to go through something like what we've gone through. So I'd just be curious from each of you, starting with Jay, 
um, how has COVID affected your, um, your business? Um, and or for that matter, you could also comment on the industry, the health industry, as far as you see in Nigeria. Okay, thank you. So, I mean, I think healthcare um, at a point, e-health, um, I think benefited a lot from uh, COVID. It solved the problem that um, major problem that I mentioned earlier about education, because a lot of people were forced to, you know, sit at home, and it didn't it didn't throw away. It didn't all of a sudden stop people from getting sick. So we still had a lot of people who were sick who were home and didn't have access to healthcare. And um, before this, we were trying to do or get a lot of partnerships with the health insurance companies you know, and, and other organizations. And we found that they were reaching out to us because health insurance companies already had an obligation you know, to provide access to healthcare to their end release, but they weren't fulfilling that because this end release couldn't go out because of the lockdown. And then uh, there was telemedicine. And at that point, we were having, we, we had about 1,500 consultations a day. Um, some of these doctors who couldn't get to the hospitals, you know, still had work because we, we still paid them, you know. So COVID um, exposed us to um, financial institutions who wanted to use telemedicine as a CSR uh, a project. And for us, it was an acquisition strategy for us. So um, they were paying for access to, for their customers for a certain period. And for us was as, as far as they get access to the service, they become our customers, our paying customers after uh, the two months period. And we found that, you know, state governments and the federal government, you know, uh, Lagos State uh, General Hospitals reach out to us and said, we're losing a lot of customers. The customers are afraid of coming to the hospital. And what we're doing we started digitalizing the hospitals, the 27 general hospitals in the state where you can still have access to your surgeons and to your general practitioners, you know, through the tremendous cap. And so there was a tremendous, there has been tremendous growth um, uh, because of uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, but for us, more importantly, was that the education and the awareness, you know, became paramount. and those questions that we, we got asked about how these doctors would have access to, you know, give proper diagnosis, you know, people had no options than to use it. And then all we were getting was, you know, good reviews at the end of the day. And then they were also educating their colleagues and saying, oh, I tried this. And I mean, something amazing happened about three weeks ago when the protest um, went on in Lagos. And there was a lockdown in Lagos State. Uh, we had a patient who, who was pregnant and in labor. And there was a lockdown and she couldn't leave her house. And she got to know about Tremendoc and she signed up. And the doctors were able to manage her throughout the night remotely. And in the morning, she was, was taken to the hospital and, and she gave birth successfully. And so with this kind of stories, we're able to tell people that, you know, we're not saying that you shouldn't go to the hospital, but we're saying that, that this can bridge a gap, you know, where there are not enough doctors, uh, you know, in the healthcare system in Nigeria. That's, that's another uh, issue entirely. So what we're doing with telemedicine is bridging the gap. We have doctors who sit in other states and remotely have customers who tag them as favorite doctors and they become personal with each other. You know, without actually seeing physically. So I think that the pandemic really helped in that aspect. And Jay, just a quick follow on. Um, so, do you think in Nigeria, COVID has kind of pushed this debate about innovation past the point of no return? Meaning that even though we've heard now there's a vaccine, et cetera, do you think it's forever going to change now the interaction model between providers and patients? Or do you see because of the vaccine, things will go back to the old way? Um, things can never go back <laughs> the old way because um, I mean we've had we've had uh, I, I was I was part of a session um, some weeks back and then the a representative from the Ministry of Health you know um, mentioned that they they begin to they put in together a committee to regulate telemedicine because they weren't paying attention to it but with COVID they found out that this this is a sector that we weren't looking at but definitely is here to stay. You know, and um, we've had 
you know, state government say telemedicine is part of the provision for healthcare, and we are putting them, we're putting telemedicine in our health insurance scheme. You know, okay. then the only kind of providers they had were hospitals directly or doctors directly, but now they're seeing health tech as a provider that needs to be, you know, part of the insurance scheme. Great, thank you. So Henry, uh, same question, COVID-19, across the vast portfolio of businesses that you cover, what's been the effect? Sorry, just getting myself a mute. Um, there you are. Ernest, yeah. It, it, it was a mix, it's a mixed bag. Huh? I don't think I've ever worked so hard in my life. And, uh, and that goes for the whole of it. Tease. Yeah, I tell you, this was, yeah. a, this was a, and we still in it. So, so on the good sides, we have Joomla on PPEs and I mean, they, they're having a fantastic year providing on our tech businesses, anything that had to do with online sales, uh, phenomenal. You know, the, the, the world really moved toward, uh, well, had to really, um, and e-commerce platforms. On our uh, mobile healthcare business, also fantastic. You know, we, uh, we had, um, there's an enormous need, and I think the panelists have touched on so many good points um, of, you know, people needing access to healthcare, and we take it to them. We have a business of a bunch of PhD, I call them kids because they're still in their 20s. So they are kids in my world. And um, that's just these PhD genius kids that write algorithms for us in occupational health. So we've seen, you know, just the ability to keep a truck driver healthy through monitoring and diagnostics or one of our clients, they are security firms, you know, that, um, you know, in South African context, if you if you cannot come to the gate and a security complex, then that provider needs to have a backfill. So keeping those people, all sorts of Ocu Health examples and primary care examples there, where we've built, um, you know, wallet system. So on the tech side and on the PPEs and the mobile, fantastic. Where we really suffered are any of our businesses that was related to electives. Um, and they, I think it's a global thing, you know, we, we couldn't foresee that, um, you know, if elective procedures are canceled, then they're canceled, you know. So what we have managed, just for the interest of the group, not all electives in the way that the South African country is defined, elective, you know, in some of our cases, it's time sensitive to it. You know, if you have to go in and have a stint, or you got to have to have your operated on in, in, under such pain, it's not trauma, but it's needed. And it's not like something like ophthalmology, that business of ours suffered the most, but it's not like you can wait for your lens to be replaced. You know, some of these are, you really need to do the next week or two, you can't wait. And um, we don't have the actual numbers in us, but we are aware of some people that have passed away that couldn't get to care and they, they, they shouldn't have. You know, they, we could have helped them and elective cancellations blocked that. So, um, What's interesting, maybe as last comment, is we, we have alter. Uh, we've developed that we strap onto people's chest and we monitor people remotely for five days uh, and then get it's loaded into a cart for us and we have our engines that it puts and give the EG to the cardiologist. And it's fantastic. The uptake was great. But we actually thought it would be even better during COVID, but that was the only real surprise that it just kind of stabilized there. And the result could be that the cardiologist couldn't see people. That, that might be the reason. But it's only a bit of surprise that caught us off guard because we, we, they would, they would. But since, I say, since September, I don't know about the rest of the world, but since we are down to level one and two and so on, we have seen huge bounce back. You know, we um, are happy to report that. But April, May, June, yeah, they were torrents on the other side. So this is really why I think we need to prevent the second wave, you know, through what's happening in America and Europe at the moment, which are going back into lockdowns. You know, you can just imagine hostels being overwhelmed that they can't actually see people for all other needs, right? Which would really be devastating. Uh, Suleiman, for yourself, the Aga Khan Health Services and COVID, how has that affected you guys? So honest, um, and every, everyone has said this, it was really a rough patch. Um, uh, you know, you started worrying about the 
health sector's capability and capacity to deal with COVID uh, across the countries where we operate, even in our institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, take a country like Tanzania, which has less than 100 ventilators that function for a population of 60 million people. And you can imagine the fears and the level of concern that existed, um, you know, that existed in the country. Uh, PPEs were a significant challenge. There is very little manufacturing that happens uh, across East Africa. Uh, very little in Kenya, uh, very little in Tanzania and Uganda for sure. Uh, and importing PPEs was a night. I mean, there were like 95 plus countries that had export bans on PPEs, partial or full. Uh, and it became it became a real challenge. I mean, uh, you know, we can we can we can talk about the money part of it. That that you know, I mean, N95 masks were available for like $15 and $18 compared to $3. But even getting it at that price became a significant a significant challenge. Uh, staff concerns uh, paramount, very very important. Um, and we struggled. We struggled with staff getting infected. We struggled with. Uh, providing psychosocial support to our staff. Uh, and that was, uh, and then you know, eventually we had to, we had this uh, brilliant, brilliant company out of the UK that provided virtual psychosocial support for, for our staff. Uh, patients stopped coming. I mean, patients who did not require, you know, who could postpone their care, uh, did not want to enter a health facility. And that did a lot of financial stress. And, you know, and that's what I'm saying is not, is, I mean, it's something which, uh, which, which we have seen across the world in health systems. Um, and, uh, and really the fear was that if kids don't come for, for, their, for their vaccinations or if, or if uh, patients adult of the adult population postpones their cardiovascular appointments, it's gonna come back to haunt us in the next uh, few months and years. Um, so, so I think it became, it became tough. What helped us, and again, many of you have said this, we moved very quickly to virtual care as well. Uh, so we had virtual consultations. Uh, we launched a coronavirus check app, um, and we started home care. And I was surprised with the uptake of home care. So you know, I mean, you this was this was to deliver pharmacies and and you know pick up samples and so on. Uh, so this, so these are the two areas that we are we are now uh, moving ahead quite aggressively to establish our digital health uh, infrastructure. Uh, and to establish home care, home care as a separate uh, business line. So clearly, I mean, financial stress, um, uh, availability of PPEs, technology, uh, infrastructure, staff, uh, all of that have tested us. But I think, I think we as a system, and I can, and I know this is this is true for many of us, uh, and for many health systems. I think, I think those systems have emerged stronger, have emerged mm -hmm. much more quickly today. Uh, and that to me is the positive, positive side of things. I mean, would I, I would never want to go through what we went through in April, May and June. I mean, it was, it was terrible. Uh, yes. But I guess um, we are, we are where we are in November. There's a lot of hope now with the vaccine and so on. Um, so let's just, um, let's just see how we can build more resilient uh, health systems. Yeah. Uh, Loretta, um, given uh, the role that you play, particularly with the Tech Emerge program, I think you must have a really interesting perspective on COVID-19. I'm curious, for example, have you seen more requests around COVID-related tech coming your way? Uh, what's your perspective here? So I think what we saw, particularly in the beginning with, again, a lot of our um, clients and health systems that we work with are the private sector side. And so I think around the world, as everyone's saying, there was a lot of people were staying away from the health system. So a lot of the private health facilities were seeing a drastic reduce in, reduction in footfall, a decrease in revenue. To Hungary's point, it was uh, less elective surgeries. So I think there were, we saw a mix where a lot of health systems said, now is not a good time to engage. And in many markets, it was the public system who were taking the lead in COVID except for some, a few select private sector facilities. So they said, come back and talk to us in a few months. And then in other cases, they said, well, we have some now a bit more breathing room because we're not as busy. We can maybe take a relook and reassess our strategy and where we might want to look at new technologies. Although it was more common with the former. Um, but what we have seen is that as people have said, some of the solutions that got more traction and interest is the, the telemedicine. Um, there was, a, 
Interestingly, more interest in patient engagement tools, uh, particularly around things like NCD. So how do you keep that continuity of care um, and with at-risk patients in diabetes and hypertension uh, with COVID angle being um, more pronounced? So it's like, how do we keep engaging with them if, if they're worried to come into the health facility? There is more uh, pivoting to uh, e-prescription and delivery of care, again, so people don't have to come into the health facilities. But on the tech side, we also saw a lot of tech companies looking and reassessing their own product offering and seeing how they could then address the situation. And so a lot of new, um, everyone rushing to try to see for those are capabilities on the testing side, also uh, symptoms checkers. Um, we've seen use of like portable ultrasound that is able to detect pulmonary complications from COVID-19. So there's a, a lot of, uh, reassessing and repositioning products to try to support during the, the COVID-19 uh, situation. And same thing with uh, the online training. Um, so a lot of more acceptance and interest in digital, although then it depends, each health system is sort of on their own journey and whether they're seeing patients and whether they're sort of entrenched or open to new uh, solutions. Ernest, I think you're on mute. Uh, yes, NSD on mute. Yeah, okay. Here I am. <laughs> I hope you can hear me. I uh, think so at this point, I'd like to go to the questions from the audience. And um, where it's been assigned to a particular person, I will uh, mention that. And where it is not, um, I will try and figure out who the best person is or ask for volunteers to answer that question. Uh, so the first question is to Mr. Suleiman. Uh, what would be your advice for Singapore companies such as medical suppliers and equipment companies looking to work in, with healthcare providers like the Aga Khan um, network? So, um, so the advice is simple. I mean, for us, uh, we operate a global purchasing program uh, for all our hospitals, which are 21 hospitals across the world. Uh, we have a purchasing office in uh, Kenya as well. And, uh, and, and again, we deal directly, but we also deal through local distributors depending on the, on the, on the item that is being procured. So if you talk of a, of a medical equipment technology that requires application training, requires biomedical engineering support, then we prefer to work through a local distributor. Uh, but clearly on consumables, uh, supplies, uh, we prefer to work directly with manufacturers and suppliers. But, but you know, it's in the interest of, um, of Singaporean companies to uh, establish uh, a local distributorship in the countries in the countries of East Africa, and uh, and and again, market assessments will have to be carried out. You will have to see what the competition is, who's there. Uh, the governments are major purchasers. Uh, the medical stores department in Tanzania and its equivalent in Kenya, and uh, and again, we need to. Uh, those companies need to see what uh, what the what the government stores departments are buying and procuring and distributing. So I think I think the regulatory environment needs to be understood. Uh, so it's not I mean it's not simple. Some of these uh, countries and I must admit are difficult to operate when it comes to the to the regulatory uh, regu regulatory environment and the number of approvals that are required to start uh, start uh, distributing or or establishing companies. But that is the opportunity. It's again 160 million uh, population that is waiting to be to be to be reached out to. So so by all means, I mean I'll be happy to leave my contacts or the contacts of our purchasing guides, uh, and you know very happy to work through Lynn and a team uh, to provide those contacts. Um, the second question they didn't ask the scientific individual is what is a pricing model that works for a startup given that most Africans have sensitive price points. So this one, I'd need a volunteer. Andre, do you wanna take that? Yeah, look, I think this is, I'm brave having an opinion on this, but uh, so I guess as, as and maybe not so much as with tease, but you know, I have, um, over the years, um, done quite a bit of startups and, 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 you know, doing all sorts of stuff and tech and med and all that jazz. And um, I think for a startup, you, you gotta identify pretty quickly um, 
you know, how fast you can fail and find, you know, get that threshold for yourselves, you know, understand what your market is, understand who do you sell to and understand how that market, because I see there's a question on wearables that I think will attach to this. You know, we have had over the years, many failures and many successes. And I think for any entrepreneurs that start things, they almost got to be willing to fail a bit um, to get those learnings, tweak it a bit. And I would say, and, and then surround yourself with the right partners. Don't go with this alone. You know, find yourself in a team of people that are knowledgeable in different spaces. You know, I have seen so many people that go at stuff alone and they might be good as a, as a product engineer, but they, they suck at selling. Or they might be good at this, but they're financially not too astute or whatever the case may be. So uh, often I think uh, startups get it wrong that they don't understand the market or the nuances of running a business or what a business is about. So um, maybe in that order, understand if your market really needs what you putting to them and make sure that you've got the right team around you to, to back that. And then whoever your financier is, you know, often if it's yourself, it's great because then you're really committed, you know. But even if it's other people's money, it's fine. But then manage that expectation in terms of returns. I think there's often with, if it's like, for example, with T's, this is relevant to us, it's a startup, but uh, we've got, um, you know, our investors are, are very invested and they believe in our story and they provide us a huge amount of money to, to grow the story. And you find that on start with success first and then success kind of books success, right? So you kind of get this momentum. So try something that you know is a low hanging fruit kind of thing in, in our world. It's different maybe to what the question is. But as you land those successes, your investors are keen to put more and more and more. And, and then the return starts almost as like a self-fulfilling cycle it becomes. Um, and, but you've got to have shareholders also take COVID. You know, our shareholders have been great. You know, we haven't had in the first five months the budget numbers that we are. We're now back on budget and we're very bullish because we're still on level one. But they wrote it with us. You know, it's, 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 it's very important to have your financier on board with your program and not arrive at your board meetings with a spreadsheet. You know, they've got to arrive there with a different attitude. I hope that helps. Thanks. Um, this next question, maybe Loretta, I'd be curious to hear your opinion. Are there any solid proven opportunities on low cost healthcare fitness wearables? So in terms, of, at least from what I see in East Africa and maybe in South Africa, there's more uptake. But even we did have a lot of wearables that applied to our Tech Emerge program and we didn't, we didn't shortlist any of them. I think it's too early here for people to be, there's less of a preventative uh, care model and a lot of them depends on the price point. Some of the solutions were 100 US dollars. And it's like, I don't think it's gonna, there'll only be a small market that you can tap into with those kind of solutions. I think it's still a ways from here. Once corporates maybe start getting wellness programs and start um, looking to see, okay, how can you link that with insurance? If you then start having better health outcomes and see some insurance reductions at the back end. Um, but for us, and that's B2C. So I was going directly to the consumer. So I was like, what's the channel? And again, here, I think there are, this market size to tap into in East Africa, I think is relatively small. And again, maybe in the South Africa context, there, there would be a, a bigger uptake on that side. But so far we haven't seen, uh, it's not something that we're focused on. Um, right. And can I only make one comment back on the pricing point? Just yeah, quickly. Absolutely. So in terms of, I think that the big key is also the value proposition. So what is the, the difference that you're offering to the alternative and what's currently in the market and that, is it either higher value for same price point or uh, cheaper than the alternative? I think some of the things it's good to think about if the, if the capability to do innovative pricing models, whether it's pay per use, although what we have found is that might work well in the private sector uh, where you can pay incrementally, but it's a struggle for the governments because they're used to buying a thousand pens. So they wanna do one procurement and they can't, don't know how to procure if it's on a continuous basis. So. That's one of the things that the governments are struggling with. How do you have uh, models to uh, engage with digital service providers? Yeah, yeah. Th thanks so much for mentioning that, Loretta, because it does also remind me of one issue, for example, we've encountered, which is uh, governments aren't that, they don't really have the mechanisms to purchase 
things like software as a service, you know, where it's on an ongoing bill as opposed to one annual sort of fee that they're used to with traditional procurement. So we found often, uh, even when you have the right tool, they know they want it, but if the method you need to be paid through is something that the government has never done before, that often becomes an obstacle. You know? so. Ernest, um, just a quick comment from me. Um, on the world of wearables for the audience, what we've seen out of our world, I think our successes with wearables and diagnostics and gathering data and other, is because Vetees takes on the clinical plane. We don't take exactly. on a wellness plane. So, exactly. you know, we're of the opinion, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone in this forum, is that, you know, when the Googles and Apples and, you know, the big boys from the East and the, and, and the West you know, if they can, if they can easily just replicate what they do, and I have personal experience in this. You know, many many ago, I was busy with a venture, and then WhatsApp came along, and it completely squashed us. You know, and it came out of nowhere. So I would say, if you're going to this market, I agree fully with the rest of there, is that you gotta you gotta have some defensive barriers up in terms of your unique uh, proposition. And I think if you're just in wearables and you just diagnose and all that it's going to be very hard for you because of this international global players. You've got to have some sort of defense mechanism. And in our case, I use the halter and that we have quite a few of them in the business in terms of blood pressure and all sorts of goodies. Um, they're the defenses. Um, you know, we have access to cardiologists, you, you know, and to a point now we've signed a partnership agreement with Apple. So now it's a partnership, you know, and it's not exactly. because they like us so much. I think they just realize they can't do as direct without you. So the moment they can come direct, they will, you know, in my opinion, you know, so um, anyway, I thought, let me just add my two cents. Thank you. Next question I'll direct to Jay is, how do you see telemedicine evolving in terms of technology? Okay, so right now for us, it's, it's more of access. And I think our goal is to, is to provide um, access across, across Nigeria. Uh, which is one big thing that that Nigeria lacks when it comes to healthcare. Um, mm -hmm. We've seen we've seen different um, advancements, um, you know, in different parts of the world. Um, I've had, you know, senior surgeons walk up to me and say, "It's impossible that your solution can can get me in a room, you know, with my junior surgeons, and you know, direct them and guide them, you know, through." certain kind of um, surgery and um, and for me that's 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 amazing and and i guess it's happening in some hospitals in, in different parts of the world and and that's where we're looking at um getting to our primary goal right now is start from the basics which is what we're doing providing the access uh, using our technology and um, in the next couple of years and with the advancement of of the access then we start thinking about you know advancing the technology as well um i mean the there's virtual reality where, you know, your doctors can feel like they're in the room with you, you know, whilst you're, you're having the consultation. So there are different advancements. And, and we'll be talking about wearable devices. Um, Jen um, from Enterprise Singapore just connected me to a, a company in Singapore. And we we're talking about how they can bring in um, wearable devices and how we can partner together. Uh, for our for our customers, because that for us will enhance the consultations the doctors will be having with them, where they're able to read their heart rates, you know, real time, um, check the blood pressure real time, you know, whilst they're having this consultation remotely. And so this is this is things where technology can help in you know getting near to perfect consultations from a remote uh, perspective. You know, so when it comes to technology, there's I think the sky's the limit um, when it comes to telemedicine. Right. Next question here is like a three-part question, <laughs> asking three days. I'll probably need volunteers for each each part. So the first part is related to it sounds like regulatory. So more of a general question: Could we understand a bit about healthcare regulations, particularly for medical devices, um, uh, in that? Are there stringent requirements such as FDA, CE, et cetera, to be met before manufacturers allowed to introduce and distribute medical devices in South Africa? So I think probably, Henry, that might be you. 
Um, yeah, um, Ernest, in our experience, um, I mentioned it earlier, you know, the funds, well, depends on your angle. If, 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 if your idea is that to use a wearable to, let's take one of the funds here, is a fund called Discovery. They have a vitality program that keeps people healthy of their members. So they would be interested in a wearable that track and trace that. But that's on a, but it doesn't mean you can claim for it. It just means that it's interesting. Um, and the benefit then sits between you and them. Um, so whoever the provider is of that wearable device, it's great. It might be a very cool gadget gathering all sorts of things, but to monetize that would be tricky for that person because where do they slot themselves in the, in the value chain in terms of, so what we have seen in terms of claiming against these devices on a clinical level, it's different. On a just straightforward wearable device, um, you know, it's tricky because they would say, has it been clinically proven? How do you show that it has benefit? You know, then it goes into an entire process. That's what I mentioned right at the beginning of this talk, you know, where you have that uh, analysis framework, the HMT. Yeah. So, um, so that that is just, there's, there's certainly, as Larry also earlier said, South Africa is a very innovative country. You know, the guys are keen to play with stuff and they're keen to explore. You know, you have a very wide variety of type of people and, 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 and gadgets that they like to explore. But the, um, the monetization thereof is tricky. So we have seen some people that uh, um, we work quite, quite a bit with um, one of our companies, we unpack the wearables and we code on the firmware and then the firmware becomes richer than just the diagnostic. It actually reads clinical data. We've seen some success, not great yet. Uh, maybe in a year's time when we talk again, you know, I can share some there, but there's certainly an interest. But um, there's no lack of interest. I would just do ever ask the question. Um, but there's no block in South Africa of bridges and stuff. So just where you. Any other questions on Greg from the other panelists? I would just say if you're looking at the. Uh, so beyond South Africa, so even in East African markets, all the regulatory uh, bodies are different. They're trying to harmonize, but each, if you want to register your product in Kenya and Uganda, you have to do it individually within each country. The different regulatory bodies are at different stages where some have risk-based uh, assessments when, and others do not. So I think it's very much an evolving situation. You need to understand the specific market that you're looking at. In some cases, like I know in Kenya, if, you, if you're coming in and you already have FDA approval or CE mark, then it can help accelerate your registration locally. Um, but again, this is an evolving situation, so you need to really understand the market entry for a specific market you're targeting. Exactly. And, and I think to me, this just highlights the importance of knowing someone like Loretta uh, to the Singaporean companies who will have some knowledge about what's going on and then she can link you to people in country who are really knowledgeable about that particular thing. Loretta, very quickly, if you don't mind, uh, maybe to this issue of demand for healthcare for, this is a very specific one on solutions for infertility, for example, uh, consumer AI ovulation tracker, semen analyzer, and remote temperature monitoring. Have you seen um, uh, kind of demand for these types of things? So personally, no, but it's, and, and maybe the Ecocon has um, thoughts on East Africa, because often when we are sitting down with health systems, we do take a broad approach where we go anything from point of care diagnostics to EMR to operational efficiency to imaging. So we cover a gamut. And so we do hear a lot of different needs, but that has not come up like the fertility and uh, those package of goods have not come up as a top need in our conversations. It doesn't mean there is not demand there but it's not something that we have had discussions with or actively looking to pursue, but I don't, I'm, I don't have a sense market-wide. Uh, Suleiman, have you heard any demand for this through your networks? So, uh, so not really. Having said that, I agree with Loretta that it's not that the demand does not exist, but it's not at the top of the right exactly. list. Exactly. So when you talk of uh, prior, it's really non-communicable diseases, infectious diseases, yeah, uh, but it's not something that is uh, actively spoken of. Yeah, yeah. My my opinion here is um, it would it would probably potentially there could be a really good market for it, although small, because usually people who can afford you know um, 
these type of reproductive health services like artificial insemination, et cetera, usually are the higher end, uh, you know, socioeconomic, uh, of a socioeconomic scale. And so those services, at least I know in South Africa, are extremely expensive. And um, obviously people, wealthy people who are desperate to have a baby will pay a lot of money if there's gonna be something that will help um, for inc improve their odds, right? Um, so it, it doesn't mean there's no market, it could be a niche market that's really good. Um, but again, you'd have to potentially maybe speak to, um, uh, you know, providers who are in that industry to assess an interest in maybe they can be a channel partner for these types of tools. Um, and then lastly, how do you see demand among telemedicine operators for home use consumer healthcare gadgets such as, um, you know, temperature monitoring, that's a repeat again, uh, white label arrangement for API interface or user data to be transmitted to doctors on the platform. How do foreign manufacturers penetrate the market and what are key challenges to take note of? So maybe Jay, again, this might more fall in your, uh, in your territory. Yeah, so um, like I said, telemedicine is quite new um, in Nigeria and um, Tremendok is, is leading in that space. And so basically what it is, is that we're just, we're more or less set in the path um, as to how other uh, platforms or other solutions follow. Um, I, like I said before, our major goal right now is to first and foremost solve the problem of access and then following up with how do we improve the access that we have given uh, to people across Nigeria. Um, so when it comes to digital solutions, we're looking at those um, devices and monitoring services to improve the diagnosis or the consultations that our doctors have. But mm -hmm. like I said, we haven't really started and I, I don't think any other platform is doing uh, anything remotely close to that. So what we're doing currently is saying we just want to provide this access and then in the future go into um, either wearable devices or other other sort of solutions that would improve um, the consultations that the doctors give. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question here is one for Loretta. It feels like a little bit of a repeat, but maybe you may or just want to comment. It's a bit of a comment in the question talking about uh, the appropriateness of the solution to the existing problem is key for uptake and acceptance, right? Um, which I think we could all definitely agree with. Um, but, you know, clearly, at least even in my experience, still, even when you have a solution, there's an acknowledged need. And frankly, half of the time, there's even an acknowledged and we want it, you find that people just don't procure, right? Um, and I don't know if you just have any a few further comments on this issue. Sure, I think that, yes, and I, I read the comment too, and I agree that the, the tech has to address an actual real need. Um, but then sometimes it then can be the financing barrier. So A, they need to understand, is there value for money? Is this actually going to end? Will it work in their own operating uh, systems and then is there value for money? Do they see the benefit in doing so? Part of one of the relatively easier benefits of being at the IFC because our uh, off takers and partners are in the private sector is that often if they see the value add, they can buy if they want. Where in, because I think that question also was referencing the government at Rwanda because on the public sector side, it's a big challenge to try to get to them to engage. And so even if they see value, they may not have the financing in the back end. To, and yeah. Kenya is known as for pilot-itis where there's so many, and it is donors who come in and they'll do pilot with the government. The government will elect the solution, but then it goes nowhere. So part of yeah. it is how do you avoid the, the pilot-itis and try to identify financing upfront in a way that can actually work and be um, mainstreamed into the health systems budgeting. Um, and then also to that question, I think that individual app referenced the drones in Rwanda, uh, which was the company Zipline. As an example, in Kenya, there's also a regulatory issue. So even if something is could add value, then there might be other hurdles like regulations that might not necessarily allow it to move in the time frame that you want. Yeah, which again goes to the importance of being able to access the best local intelligence, you know, related to the use case you have in mind to really find out if it's feasible or viable, right? Um, 
the, here's another question. Um, Osteopore is a manufacturer of regenerative implants for use in craniofacial surgery, um, dental maxillofacial surgery, and in the future orthopedic spinal surgery. Which country in Africa is best suited as first go to country for such products? Ernest, uh, I'll, I'll jump in. We have a CMF range uh, from Stryker. Um, hmm. it's, uh, and we also have a 3D printing initiative going where, um, you know, where jaws are printed or facial plates or for reconstructed. Um, it's, it's around the world a much needed. Uh, your, I think to answer that question is, um, you got to also have the right surgeons in a country that can handle that kind of procedure. You know, thankfully, South Africa has got quite a few. I'm not too familiar with the lay of the land of the rest of Africa when it comes to those kind of neuro guys. And, um, but uh, I would suggest to, to, I think it's keen, um, just understand before you go into a country, whether this, the, whether in this case, osteopure, what, what we have seen, just to digress quickly, not, not all international providers of, of, of in this case, CMF, craniofactual, um, wants to sell in all countries and they all got their rules. Um, and Striker is a good example. Um, so just first understand if your supplier is willing to sell in the country you're interested in, understand if there are surgeons there that can do the procedure and then go and do the price points and see the, if the funds will pay for it and all the public sector. Certainly a need and we do doing business in that in South Africa. Yeah. Any of the other panelists want to comment? Suleiman, maybe? So, so honest, um, uh, clearly Kenya is a country that might offer some opportunity and some potential. Uh, but between uh, Tanzania and Uganda, I know that the these human resources are not in place uh, at this point at least. So I think, I mean, that does not mean that, uh, that the government's not trying. I know that in Tanzania, for example, the Mohimbili Orthopedic Institute, which is being, uh, which has been established as a spine and, uh, and really an orthopedic uh, center of excellence, um, you know, is trying hard, but, but, it's, but it still has ways to go. So if I were to pick within the East African countries, I would say Kenya. I mean, I know that there are, there are um, some decent human resources available there and infrastructure. It's not just having the people, it's also having, having the safe operating rooms and technology and so on. So that would be my take, but clearly uh, there is a need and it requires more uh, market uh, ex exploration. Well, thank you so much. Um, panelists, I, I, this time has gone by really fast as we expected. Uh, so we're coming to the end of the session. Um, at this point, um, I'd like to invite Bridget uh, back in to make a few comments. Hi, thanks very much, Ernest. And also thanks really to all of our panelists kind of fueling all of the many questions that we got. I think you can tell sort of the audience has been very engaged and sort of learned a lot. Um, for those who have posted questions but didn't get a chance for them to have answered, I think we will take note of them and see if we can address them offline. Um, otherwise, you can also pop us an email. Um, we've kind of flashed up all of our contact details, so feel free to just drop us um, an email if you have a query about a particular market. Um, and we'll also be quite happy to see how we can support uh, your interests in the respective markets as well. Um, we have recorded this webinar. Um, after this event, we will be sending out a link to the recording to all participants, mm -hmm. and it would also include a link to a survey so that we can also get some of your thoughts. Um, but otherwise, this brings us to the end of our webinar series. Thank you all once again for participating and being so engaging. And once again, also to our panelists, really appreciate you taking the time and sort of sharing all of your knowledge and experiences. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of the day. Thank, Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.